Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian. Welcome back to another reading of H.G. Wells' The Outline of History. In our last two videos, we looked at how H.G. Wells understood the first and second industrial revolutions, and then we looked at his treatment of the rise of socialism, or I guess what you could say is the rise of the modern left in the Western tradition. Now we take a look at something that's a little bit more scattershot. This is the combination of the rise of the belief in evolution and the impact that had on society, also the political impact that it had. We'll also look at the idea of nationalism. Spoiler alert, H.G. Wells is not a fan of nationalism. And we'll also look at his comments on the Great Exhibition of 1851, where Prince Albert and Queen Victoria put on a grand spectacle for the people of England to foster a greater interest in education. So to focus first on Darwin, the rise of Darwin's theories and their acceptance by a broad swath of the public is something that apparently affected H.G. Wells a lot more than I realized. He seems to be someone who did have something of a religious crisis due to this, and he is at pains to try to explain how, even though the rise of Darwinian evolution disproves many of the claims of the Bible, such as the idea of the earth being created in seven days, or the age of the earth only going back 7,000 years, and things of that nature, how um, you can have religion without having a lot of the pieces that are supposed to go with it. That you don't have to have all of these specific doctrines in place for religion to be valuable and to provide meaning. So he's clearly someone who was much more affected by that than I realized, and I found his discussion of this very interesting. This is also something that is surprisingly still relevant in 2020, where there are a whole lot of people who are religious and still have trouble trying to reconcile their modern scientific worldview with their religious faith. So this is something that has been a problem for a while. Um, interestingly enough, in today's world, there are people who think that if they refute some of Darwin's claims from 1859, the origin of species, that they will somehow refute the theory of evolution as if it hasn't moved on and been greatly, greatly enhanced by the work of subsequent scholars. But let's not get into that. When it comes to the section on nationalism, here we see that H.G. Wells effectively thinks that nationalism as a broad force was more or less the main driver of the chaos of World War I. He is deeply suspicious of and contemptful of the idea of nationalism and its adherents. And for the most part, given his experience, I absolutely see his point. He also is correct to observe that historically the idea of nationalism is not rooted in some deep past and it certainly isn't something driven by some deep-seated concern for truth or it's not some essential thing which is part and parcel of the human experience and goes back to the deep depths of time. As someone who studied the broad swath of history he knows that nationalism as it existed in his day and indeed in our day is something which was more or less invented mostly in the early modern period. It was somewhat forced upon many places in the world, as Wells uses the example of India, a place which had no real national identity until everywhere else in the world started getting one, and then India wanted to be part of the club, so they pretended that there was some overarching connection between all the peoples of India, and there you go. And for the last part, uh, Wells clearly thought that Britain had fallen behind culturally due to the obsession with industrialization up to 1851 and that this great festival put Britain back on track when it comes to making cultural discoveries. I assume he will elaborate upon this further as this is designed as a pivot to a discussion of the culture of the 19th century which then will evolve into a discussion of Napoleon III, but that is a different reading for a different time. Today we'll focus on Darwin, nationalism, and the Great Exhibition. So, I've rambled on enough. Let's get to see what Wells has to say. Chapter 37. The Realities and Imaginations of the 19th Century. Section 6. How Darwinism Affected Religious and Political Ideas. While the mechanical revolution which the growth of physical science had brought about was destroying the ancient social classification 
of the civilized state which had been evolved through thousands of years, and producing new possibilities and new ideals of a righteous human community and a righteous world order, a change at least as great and novel was going on in the field of religious thought. That same growth of scientific knowledge from which sprang the mechanical revolution was the moving cause of these religious disturbances. In the opening chapters of this outline, we have given the main story of the record of the rocks. We have shown life for the little beginning of consciousness that it is in the still waiting vastness of the void of space and time. But before the end of the 18th century, this enormous prospect of the past, which fills a modern mind with humility and illimitable hope, was hidden from the general consciousness of our race. It was veiled by the curtain of a Sumerian legend. The heavens were no more than a stage background to a little drama of kings. Men had been too occupied with their own private passions and personal affairs to heed the intimations of their own great destiny that lay about them everywhere. They learnt their true position in space long before they placed themselves in time. We have already named the earlier astronomers and told how Galileo was made to recant his assertion that the earth moved around the sun. He was made to do so by the church, and the church was stirred to make him do so because any doubt that the world was the center of the universe seemed to strike fatally at the authority of Christianity. Now, upon that matter, the teller of modern history is obliged to be at once cautious and bold. He has to pick his way between cowardly evasion on the one hand and partisanship on the other. As far as possible, he must confine himself to facts and restrain his opinions. Yet it is well to remember that no opinions can be altogether restrained. The writer has his own very strong and definite persuasions, and the reader must bear that in mind. It is a fact in history that the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth had in it something profoundly new and creative. He preached a new kingdom of heaven in the hearts and in the world of men. There was nothing in his teaching, so far as we can judge it at the distance and time, to clash or interfere with any discovery or expansion of the history of the world and mankind. But it is equally a fact in history that St. Paul and his successors added to or completed or imposed upon or substituted another doctrine for, as you may prefer to think, the plain and profoundly revolutionary teachings of Jesus by expounding a subtle and complex theory of salvation, a salvation which could be attained very largely by belief and formalities without any serious disturbance of the believer's ordinary habits and occupations, and that this Pauline teaching did involve very definite beliefs about the history of the world and man. It is not the business of the historian to controvert or explain these matters. The question of their ultimate significance depends upon the theologian. The historian's concern is merely with the fact that official Christianity throughout the world adopted St. Paul's view, so plainly expressed in his epistles and so untraceable in the Gospels that the meaning of religion lay not in the future but in the past, and that Jesus was not so much a teacher of wonderful new things as a predestinate divine blood sacrifice of deep mystery and sacredness made an atonement of a particular historical act of disobedience to the Creator committed by our first parents, Adam and Eve, in response to the temptation of a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Upon that belief in the fall as a fact, and not upon the personality of Jesus of Nazareth, upon the theories of Paul, and not upon the injunctions of Jesus, doctrinal Christianity built itself. We have already noted that this story of the special creation of the world and of Adam and Eve and the serpent was also an ancient Babylonian story, and probably a still more ancient Sumerian story, and that the Jewish sacred books were the medium by which this very ancient and primitive Heliolithic serpent legend entered Christianity. Wherever official Christianity has gone, it has taken the story with it. It has tied itself up to that very story. Until a century ago and less, the whole Christianized world felt bound to believe, and did believe, that the universe had been specially created in the course of six days by the Word of God a few thousand years before, according to Bishop Usher, 4004 BC. The Universal History in 42 volumes, published in 1779 by a group of London booksellers, 
discusses whether the precise date of the first day of creation was March 21st or September 21st, 4004 BC, and inclines to the view that the latter was the more probable season. Upon this historical assumption rested the religious fabric of the Western and Westernized civilization. And yet the whole world was littered. The mountain, the hills, the mountains, deltas, and seas were bursting with evidence of its utter absurdity. The religious life of the leading nations, still a very intense and sincere religious life, was going on in a house of history built upon sand. There is frequent recognition in classical literature of a sounder cosmogony. Aristotle was aware of the broad principles of modern geology. They shine through the speculations of Lucretius, and we have also noted Leonardo da Vinci's 1452-1519 lucid interpretation of fossils. The great Frenchman Descartes, 1596-1650, speculated boldly upon the incandescent beginnings of our globe, and a Dane, Steno, 1631-86, began the collection of fossils and the description of strata. But it was only as the 18th century drew to a close that the systematic study of geology assumed such proportions as to affect the general authority of the Bible version of the ancient Sumerian narrative. Contemporaneously with the universal history quoted above, a great French naturalist, Buffon, was writing upon the epochs of nature, 1778, epochs of nature, excuse me, and boldly extending the age of the world to 70,000 or 75,000 years. He divided his story into six epochs to square with the six days of the creation story. These days, it was argued, were figurative days. They were really ages. By that accommodating device, geology contrived to make a peace with orthodox religious teaching that lasted until the middle of the 19th century. We cannot trace here the contributions of such men as Hutton and Playfair and Sir Charles Lyell and the Frenchmen Lamarck and Cuvier in unfolding and developing the record of the rocks. It was only slowly that the general intelligence of the Western world was awakened to two disconcerting facts. Firstly, that the succession of life in the geological record did not correspond to the acts of the six days of creation, and secondly, that the record, in harmony with a mass of biological facts, pointed away from the Bible assertion of a separate creation of each species, straight towards a genetic relation between all forms of life, in which even man was included. The importance of this last issue to the existing doctrinal system was manifest. If all the animals and man had been evolved in this ascendant manner, then there had been no first parents, no Eden, and no fall. And if there had been no fall, then the entire historical fabric of Christianity, the story of the first sin and the reason for an atonement upon which the current teaching based Christian emotion and morality, collapsed like a house of cards. It was with something like horror, therefore, that great numbers of honest and religious-spirited men followed the work of the English naturalist Charles Darwin, 1809-82. In 1859, he published his Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, a powerful and permanently valuable exposition of that conception of the change and development of species which we have sketched briefly in Chapter 2. And in 1871, he he completed the outline of his work with the Descent of Man, which brought man definitely into the same scheme of development with the rest of life. Many men and women are still living who can remember the dismay and distress among ordinary intelligent people in the Western communities as the, in the invincible case of the biologist and geologist against the Orthodox Christian cosmogony unfolded itself. The minds of many resisted the new knowledge instinctively and irrationally. Their whole moral edifice was built upon false history. They were too old and set to rebuild it. They felt the practical truth of their moral convictions, and this new truth seemed to them incompatible with that. They believed that to assent to it would be to prepare a moral collapse for the world. And so they produced a moral collapse by not assenting to it. The universities in England, particularly being primarily clerical in their constitution, resisted the new learning very bitterly. During the 70s and 80s, a stormy controversy raged throughout the civilized world. 
The quality of the discussions and the fatal ignorance of the church may be gauged by a description in Hackett's commonplace book of a meeting of the British Association in 1860, at which Bishop Wilberforce assailed Huxley, the great champion of the Darwinian views, in this fashion. Facing, quote, Huxley with a smiling insolence, he begged to know, was it through his grandfather or grandmother that he claimed his descent from a monkey? Huxley turned to his neighbor and said, the Lord hath delivered him into my hands. Then he stood before us and spoke these tremendous words. He was not ashamed to have a monkey for his ancestor, but he would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used great gifts to obscure the truth. Another version has it. I have certainly said that a man has no reason to be ashamed of having an ape for his grandfather. If there was an ancestor whom I should feel ashamed in recalling, it would rather be a man of restless and versatile intellect who plunges into scientific questions with which he has no real acquaintance, only to obscure them by an aimless rhetoric and distract the attention of his audience from the real point at issue by eloquent digressions and skilled appeals to prejudice." End quote. These words were certainly spoken with passion. The scene was one of great excitement. A lady fainted, says Hackett. Such was the temper of this controversy. The Darwinian movement took formal Christianity unawares, suddenly. Formal Christianity was confronted with a clearly demonstrable error in her theological statements. The Christian theologians were neither wise enough nor mentally nimble enough to accept a new truth, modify their formulae, and insist upon the living and undiminished vitality of the religious reality those formulae had hitherto sufficed to express. For the discovery of man's descent from subhuman forms does not even remotely touch the teaching of the kingdom of heaven. Yet priests and bishops raged at Darwin. Foolish attempts were made to suppress Darwinian literature and to insult and discredit the exponents of the new views. There was much wild talk of the antagonism of religion and science. Now in all ages there have been skeptics in Christendom. The Emperor Frederick II was certainly a skeptic. In the 18th century, Gibbon and Voltaire were openly anti-Christian, and their writings influenced a number of scattered readers. But these were exceptional people. Now the whole of Christendom became, as a whole, skeptical. This new controversy touched everybody who read a book or heard intelligent conversation. A new generation of young people grew up, and they found the defenders of Christianity in an evil temper, fighting for their cause without dignity or fairness. It was the orthodox theology that the new scientific advancements had compromised. But the angry theologians declared that it was religion. In the end, men may discover that religion shines all the brighter for the loss of all its doctrinal wrappings, but to the young it seemed as if, indeed, there had been a conflict of science and religion, and that in that conflict science had won. The immediate effect of this great dispute upon the ideas and methods of people in the prosperous and influential classes throughout the westernized world was very uh, detrimental indeed. The new biological science was bringing nothing constructive as yet to replace the old moral standbys. A real demoralization ensued. The general level of social life in those classes was far higher in the early 20th century than in the early 17th century, but in one respect, in respect to disinterestedness and conscientiousness in these classes, it is probable that the tone of the earlier age was better than the latter. In the owning and active classes of the 17th century, in spite of a few definite infidels, there was probably a much higher percentage of men and women who prayed sincerely, who searched their souls to find if they had done evil, and who were prepared to suffer and make great sacrifices for what they conceived to be right than in the opening years of the 20th century. There was a real loss of faith after 1859. The true gold of religion was in many cases thrown away with the worn out purse that had contained it for so long, and it was not recovered. Towards the close of the 19th century, a crude misunderstanding of Darwinism had become the fundamental mind stuff of great masses of the, quote, educated everywhere. The 17th century kings and owners and rulers and leaders had had the idea at the back of their minds that they prevailed by the will of God. They really feared him. They got priests to put things right for them with him. 
When they were wicked, they tried not to think of him. But the old faith of the kings, owners, and rulers of the opening 20th century had faded under the actinic light of scientific criticism. Prevalent peoples at the close of the 19th century believed that they prevailed by virtue of the struggle for existence, in which the strong and cunning got the better of the weak and confiding. And they believed further that they had to be strong, energetic, ruthless, practical, in quotes, egotistical, because God was dead, and had always, it seemed, been dead, which was going altogether further than the new knowledge justified. They soon got beyond the first crude popular misconception of Darwinism, the idea that every man is for himself alone. But they struck the next level. Man, they decided, is a social animal like the Indian hunting dog. He is much more than a dog, but this they did not see. And just as in a pack it is necessary to bully and subdue the younger and weaker for the general good, so it seemed right to them that the big dogs of the human pack should bully and subdue. Hence a new scorn for the ideas of democracy that had ruled the earlier 19th century and a revived admiration for the overbearing and the cruel. It was quite characteristic of the times that Mr. Kipling should lead the children of the middle and upper class British public back to the jungle to learn the law, and that in his book Stalky and Co., he should give an appreciative description of the torture of two boys by three others who have, by a subterfuge, tied up their victims helplessly before revealing their hostile intentions. It is worthwhile to give a little attention to this incident in Stalky and Co., because it, lightens, it lights up the political psychology of the British Empire at the close of the 19th century very vividly. The history of the last half century is not to be understood without an understanding of the mental twist which this story exemplifies. The two boys who are tortured are, quote, bullies. That is the excuse of the tormentors. And these latter have further been incited to the orgy by a clergyman. Nothing can restrain the gusto with which they, and Mr. Kipling, set about the job. Before resorting to torture, the teaching seems to be, see that you pump up a little justifiable moral indignation, and all will be well. If you have the authorities on your side, then you cannot be to blame. Such apparently is the simple doctrine of this typical imperialist. But every bully has to be the best of his, has to, to the best of his ability, followed that doctrine since the human animal developed sufficient intelligence to be consciously cruel. Another point in the story is very significant indeed. The headmaster and his clerical assistant are both represented as being privy to the affair. They want this bullying to occur. Instead of exercising their own authority, they use these boys, who are Mr. Kipling's heroes, to punish the two victims. Headmaster and clergyman turn a deaf ear to the complaints of an indignant mother. All this Mr. Kipling represents as a most desirable state of affairs. In this we have the key to the ugliest, most retrogressive, and finally fatal idea of modern imperialism. The idea of a tacit conspiracy between the law and illegal violence. Just as the Tsardom wrecked itself at last by a furtive encouragement of the ruffians of the Black Hundreds, who massacred Jews and other people, supposed to be inimical to the Tsar, so the good name of the British imperial government has been tainted, and is still tainted, by an illegal raid made by Dr. Jameson into the Transvaal before the Boer War, by the adventures, which we shall presently describe, of Sir Edward Carson, afterwards Lord Carson, in Ireland, and by the tacit connivance of the British government in Ireland with the so-called reprisals undertaken by the loyalists against the perpetrators, or alleged perpetrators, of sin fine outrages. By such treasons against their subjects, empires destroy themselves. The true strength of rulers and empires lies not in armies and navies, but in the belief of men that they are inflexibly open and truthful and legal. So soon as a government departs from that standard, it ceases to be anything more than the gang and possession, and its days are numbered. Section 7. The Idea of Nationalism 
We have already pointed out that there must be a natural political map of the world which gives the best possible geographical divisions for human administrations. Any other political division of the world than this natural political map will necessarily be a misfit and must produce stresses of hostility and insurrection tending to shift boundaries in the direction indicated by the natural political map. These would seem to be self-evident propositions were it not that the diplomatist at Vienna evidently neither believed nor understood anything of the sort, and thought themselves as free to carve up the world as one is free to carve up such a boneless structure as a cheese. Most of the upheavals and conflicts that began in Europe as the world recovered from the exhaustion of the Napoleonic Wars were quite obviously attempts of the ordinary common men to be rid of governments that were, that were such misfits as to be in many cases intolerable. Generally, the existing governments were misfits throughout Europe because they were not socially representative, and so they were hampering production and wasting human possibilities. But when there were added to these universal annoyances, differences of religion and racial culture between the rulers and ruled, as in most of Ireland, differences in race and language, as in Austria, North Italy, and throughout most of the Austrian Empire, or differences in all these respects, as in Poland and the Turkish Empire in Europe, the exasperation drove towards bloodshed. Europe was a system governing machines abominably adjusted. From the stresses of this maladjustment, the various nationalist movements that played so large a part in history of the 19th century drew their driving force. What is a nation? What is nationality? If our story of the world has demonstrated anything, it has demonstrated the mingling of peoples and races, the instability of human divisions, the swirling variety of human groups and human ideas of association. A nation, it has been said, is an accumulation of human beings who think they are one people. But we are told that Ireland is a nation, and Protestant Ulster certainly does not share that idea, and Italy did not think it was one people until long after its unity was accomplished. When the writer was in Italy in 1916, people were saying, this war will make us one nation. Again, are the English a nation? or have they merged into a, quote, British nationality? Scotsmen do not seem to believe very much in this British nationality. It cannot be a community of race or language that constitutes a nation, because the Gales and the Lowlanders make up the Scottish nation. It cannot be a common religion, for England has scores, nor a common literature. Or why is Britain separated from the United States and the Argentine Republic from Spain? We may suggest that a nation is in effect any assembly, mixture, or confusion of peoples which is either afflicted by or wishes to be afflicted by a foreign office of its own, in order that it should behave collectively as if its needs, desires, and vanities were beyond comparison more important than the general welfare of humanity. We have already traced the development of the Machiavellian monarchist into the rule of their foreign offices playing the part of powers. This nationality, which dominated the political thought of the 19th century, was really no more than the romantic and emotional exaggeration of the stresses produced by the discord of the natural political map with unsuitable political arrangements in the interest of such powers. Throughout the 19th century, and particularly throughout its latter half, there has been a great working up of this nationalism in the world. All men are by nature partisans and patriots, but the natural tribalism of men in the 19th century was unnaturally exaggerated. It was fretted and overstimulated and inflamed and forced into the nationalistic mold. Nationalism was taught in schools, emphasized by newspapers, preached and mocked and sung into men. It became a monstrous cant which darkened all human affairs. Men were brought to feel that they were as improper without a nationality as without their clothes in a crowded assembly. Oriental peoples, who had never heard of nationality before, took to it as they took to the cigarettes and bowler hats of the West. India, a galaxy of contrasted races, religions, and cultures, Dravidian, Mongolian, and Aryan, 
became a nation. There were perplexing cases, of course, as when a young Whitechapel Jew had to decide whether he belonged to the British or the Jewish nation. Caricature and political cartoons played a large part in this elevation of the cult of these newer and bigger tribal gods, for such indeed the modern nations are, to their ascendancy over the imagination of the 19th century. If one turns over the, ra the pages of Punch, that queer contemporary record of the British soul, which has lasted now since 1841, one finds the figures of Britannia, Hibernia, France, and Germania celebrating, disputing, reproving, rejoicing, grieving. It greatly helped the diplomatist to carry on their game of great powers to convey politics in this form to the doubting general intelligence. To the common man, resentful that his son should be sent abroad to be shot, it was made clear that instead of this being merely the result of the obstinacy and greed of two foreign offices, it was really a necessary part of a righteous, inevitable, gigantic struggle between two of these dim, vast divinities. France had been wronged by Germania, or Italy was showing a proper spirit to Austria. The boy's death ceased to appear an outrage on common sense. It assumed a sort of mythological dignity. An insurrection could clothe itself in the same romantic habiliment as diplomacy. Ireland became a Cinderella goddess, Kathleen Ni Houlihan, full of heart-rending and unforgivable wrongs. And young India transcended its realities in the worship of Bandi Mataram. The essential idea of 19th century nationalism was the, quote, legitimate claim of every nation to complete sovereignty, the claim of every nation to manage all its affairs within its own territory, regardless of any other nation. The flaw in this idea is that the affairs and interests of every modern community extend to the, uppermost, the outermost parts of the world. The assassination of Sarajevo in 1914, for example, which caused the Great War, produced the utmost distress among the Indian tribes of Labrador, because that war interrupted the marketing of the furs upon which they relied for such necessities as ammunition, without which they could not get sufficient food. A world of independent sovereign nations means, therefore, a world of perpetual injuries, a world of states constantly preparing for or waging war. But concurrently and discordantly with the preaching of this nationalism, there was, among the stronger nationalities, a vigorous propaganda of another set of ideas, the ideas of imperialism, in which a powerful and advanced nation was conceded the right to dominate a group of other less advanced nations, or less politically developed nations or peoples whose nationality was still undeveloped, who were expected by the dominating nation to be grateful for its protection and dominance. This use of the word empire was evidently a different one from its formal universal significance. The new empires did not even pretend to be a continuation of the world empire of Rome. They had lost that last connection between the idea of the empire and the peace of the world. These two ideas of nationality, and as the crown of national success, empire, ruled European political thought, ruled indeed the political thought of the world, throughout the latter half of the 19th century, and ruled it to the practical exclusion of any wider concept of a common human welfare. They were plausible and dangerously unsound working ideas. They represented nothing fundamental and inalterable in human nature, and they failed to meet the new needs of world controls and world security that the mechanical revolution was every day making more imperative. They were accepted because people in general had neither the sweeping views that a study of world history can give, nor had they any longer the comprehensive charity of a world religion. Their danger to all the routines of ordinary life was not realized until it was too late. Section 8. The Great Exhibition of 1851. After the middle of the 19th century, this world of new powers and old ideas, this fermenting new wine in the old bottles of diplomacy, broke out through the flimsy restraints of the Treaty of Vienna into a series of wars. But by an ironical accident, the new system of disturbances was preceded by a peace festival in London, the Great Exhibition of 1851. This exhibition deserves a paragraph or so. 
The moving spirit in this exhibition was Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha, the nephew of Leopold I, the German king who had been placed upon the Belgian throne in 1831, and who was also the maternal uncle of the young Queen Victoria of England. She had become queen in 1837 at the age of 18. The two young cousins, they were of the same age, had married in 1840 under their uncle's auspices, and Prince Albert was known to the British as the Prince Consort. He was a young man of sound intelligence and exceptional education, and he seems to have been greatly shocked by the mental stagnation into which England had sunken. Oxford and Cambridge, those once starry centers, were still recovering, but slowly from the intellectual ebb of the later 18th century. At neither university did the annual matriculations number more than 400. The examinations were, for the most part, vico voci ceremonies. Except for two colleges in London, the University of London and one in Durham, this was all the education on a university footing that England had to offer. It was very largely the initiative of the scandalized young German who had married the British Queen, which produced the University Commission of 1850, and it was with a view to waking up England further that he promoted the first international exhibition, which was to afford some opportunity for a comparison of the artistic and industrial products of the various European nations. The project was bitterly opposed. In the House of Commons, it was prophesied that England would be overrun by foreign rogues and revolutionaries who would corrupt the morals of the people and destroy all faith and loyalty in the country. The exhibition was held in Hyde Park in a gate building of glass and iron, which afterwards was recreated as the Crystal Palace. Financially, it was a great success. It made many English people realize for the first time that theirs was not the only industrial country in the world, and that commercial prosperity was not a divinely appointed British monopoly. There was also the clearest evidence of a Europe recovering steadily from the devastation of the Napoleonic Wars, and rapidly overtaking the British lead in trade and manufacture. It was followed directly by the organization of a science and art department in 1853 to recover, if possible, the educational leeway that Britain had lost.